Neuralink will allow quadriplegics to walk again. I mean, as miraculous as it may sound, we're confident that it is possible to restore full body functionality to someone who has a severed spinal cord. So says Elon and the Neuralink team. Today, I'll explain how this is possible and what problems need to be addressed before the concept becomes a reality. <laughs> You may be surprised to learn that solving paralysis, as well as other neurologic dysfunctions, is not the driving force behind the Neuralink project, but a byproduct that will come to pass as they work towards their central mission. The overarching goal of Neuralink is to create ultimately a whole brain interface, a generalized input output device that literally could interface with every aspect of your brain. A small machine about the size of a quarter implanted in your skull will send and receive signals to and from the brain and transmit them via Bluetooth to nearby technology drastically reducing the speed at which we can communicate with said technology. So the texting on this thing is so slow I don't think I can handle it. Think and it shall be done. This is Elon's response to artificial intelligence and its hypothetical supercomputing capabilities wherein there's no delay between the mind and the computer because the mind is the computer. And whether benign or not, we'll need something to level the playing field lest we be left in the dust. Deep artificial intelligence where you could have AI that is much smarter than the smartest human on earth is a dangerous situation. Consider our current brain computer interface options. Phones, laptops, controllers. The limitation is the, the rate at which you can receive and send information. Especially the, the, the t -t today, Junior. The speed with which you can send information. Information is sent by typing, speaking into a phone, moving joysticks, etc. All much slower than the speed of thought and/or nerve impulse. His neurons are firing at super speed. Synaptic connections are off the charts. For example, it takes approximately 500 milliseconds or half a second for sensory information from the outside world to be incorporated into the conscious experience. I have super speed thinking. Computer scientist Zhang Peng Jin of the University of Pittsburgh explains, the speed of some nerve impulses is high, up to 119 meters per second, such as the impulses that travel to muscles, while others are slower, such as touch, 76.2 meters per second, and pain, 0.61 meters per second impulses. It is the reason why when you stub your toe, you feel pressure on the skin first and the feeling of pain arrives later. But we don't interact with the world through nerve impulses alone. Those nerve signals move our body to manipulate one of these interfaces to a desired effect. In order to clarify our intention or our message, we typically must perform a series of interactions. A, side, down, side, down, up, side, down, side, up. Think about how many separate nerve impulses are involved in writing an essay or shoveling a driveway. We take for granted how incredibly complex these tasks are at an operational level. More fundamentally, our body is the primary interface with the outside world. In fact, my work as an orthopedic surgeon focuses on maintaining a baseline level of functionality in this primary physical interface. If we are born with altered physiology, like Sarah Tabel, or suffer injury to the musculoskeletal system, resulting in some form of impairment or disability, it greatly affects our ability to navigate the world, communicate, or manipulate our versions of the brain-computer interface. Luckily, humans are quite adaptable. Consider the late Professor Stephen Hawking. Medicine has not been able to cure me, so I rely on technology to help me communicate and live. Although the brain is capable of processing huge amounts of information rather quickly, we must still transmit that info to the world somehow physically. Everything Stephen Hawking does on his computer is triggered by one muscle in his cheek. An infrared sensor detects when his cheek muscle moves up. In Hawking's case, the slightest movement of his cheek. But that was before the age of Neuralink. This is telepathic typing. He's not actually using a keyboard. He's moving the cursor with his mind. A Neuralink device implanted in the skull of this monkey is reading the spikes in brain activity and translating them to inputs on the computer via Bluetooth. The electric properties of the brain make this type of interaction possible. As you think and move, 
Neurons in the brain release chemicals called neurotransmitters, which generate electrical signals in neighboring neurons, which are transmitted throughout the body via nerve networks. The brain receives signals from the body in the same way. As such, the three pound gelatinous organ inside your skull is a hotbed of electrochemical activity, wherein different signals control different processes. About 100 billion neurons are each firing off five to 50 messages or action potentials per second. A 2016 journal article in Cell defined intention as the desire to affect change on our environment. And this is contained in the signals from the brain passed through the nervous system to converge on muscles that generate displacements and forces on our surroundings. If a machine can recognize the specific patterns of neural activity associated with specific intentions like moving or clicking a mouse cursor, then it can send a corresponding signal straight to the target system, bypassing the need for physical interaction entirely. Moving the mouse cursor using just his mind to the highlighted key and then spelling out what we wanted to spell. The monkey demonstrations from the recent Neuralink show and tell are very promising, but until human trials begin, we won't know how safe or practical this device is for everyday human use. Moving a cursor by thinking about moving a cursor is different from moving a cursor through physical manipulation. And there will be a learning curve that is associated with this. There are actual similar devices in later production stages that may serve to temper our expectations. It's BlackRock Neurotech and Synchron that have already beaten Neuralink to clinical trials. BlackRock's device is a chip implanted directly into the brain, while Synchron's is implanted into blood vessels in the brain. Austin is one of about a dozen people who has a BlackRock Neuroport implanted into his brain. A dive into some shallow the water left him with a broken neck between the C3 and C4 vertebrae. The spinal cord is an extension of the central nervous system, a nerve superhighway that begins at the bottom of the brain stem, ends in the low back, and carries signals to and from the brain along its length. It is a delicate band of tissues, nerves, and cells protected by the vertebral column, and when injured, function may be seriously altered below the level of the injury. Come on in. You're always thinking you're going to wake up the next day and it's just going to come back. But a catastrophic injury, in this case at the C3, C4 level, may cause irreparable damage to the nerve cells and permanently impair function below its level. Three months with really no motor gains kind of set in like, okay, this might be more of a long haul. If the muscles cannot receive messages from the brain, the body cannot move. If the body cannot send messages to the brain, you cannot feel. Now six years since his injury, he is a volunteer participant in a groundbreaking project aimed at changing the long haul for people with paralysis. A December 13 article in the New York Times explains further. The device includes a small grid of electrodes that are dipped barely two millimeters into his brain. That is linked to a portal mounted on his head and via cables to another computer. And so we're all on the same page. An electrode is a conductor through which electricity enters or leaves an object, substance, or region. The thing that allows the device to read the brain's electrical signals. Though Neuroport and Neuralink both make direct contact with the brain, allowing direct access to its electrical activity as it occurs, a side-by-side -side comparison shows important design differences. BlackRock's Neuroport features fewer electrodes and is placed on the surface of the brain in a fixed pattern and communicates with the computer via wires. Neuralink deploys 64 separate wired filaments packed with electrodes deeper into the brain matter and over a wider surface area and communicates with the computer wirelessly. This could lead to increased responsiveness in Elon's Neuralink compared to BlackRock's Neuroport, which has sobering results. Thus far, Austin Began has been able to lift a pretzel to his mouth. Don't get me wrong, this is an incredible advancement, but it's a far cry from the full body functionality that Elon mentioned during his presentation. Despite all the promise in the field, Scientists say this technology has very little to offer the average consumer, as it is merely approaching the speed and precision of able body control. Bolu Ajiboye is a biomedical professor at Case Western Reserve University who works towards refining technology that records from the brain, bypasses the spinal cord injury, allows the person to control meaningful movements of their hands. When we compare Ajiboye's research to the Neuralink demonstration, we must conclude that moving a mouse with the mind is simpler 
than performing more complex motor tasks. Positioning their arm in space, moving individual fingers, grasp different objects so that they can perform activities of daily living. In a recent New York Times article, Ajiboye describes the day spent in the lab with Begin. He will look at a moving arm or hand on a computer screen and envision himself making the same motion. That allows researchers to detect the neuron firing patterns in his brain that give rise to each movement. Those signals are communicated to a system that manipulates eight nerves in his arm to make it move. It really is remarkable that these little wires coming out of my arm are allowing something like this to happen. With hours and hours of first-hand experience under his belt, Austin Began cautions that the work can be tedious and painstaking. But even then... Just the fact of feeling the arm move is a remarkable part of it. I mean, I could do this all day. Just have it go up and down, up and down. Then again, Neuralink has had the opportunity to study other devices developments such as BlackRock's Neuroport, Utah Array, and Synchron's NeuroEP, allowing them to incorporate the best elements from each device into their design. It's uh, microfabricated on a flexible thin film array that we call threads. It's obvious that a ton of research, development, and of course, effort has gone into this design. It's fully implantable and wireless. And after the surgery, the implant is under the skin and it is invisible. It also has a battery that you can charge wirelessly. It sounds so sleek and simple, but let's not forget. The insertion process is full-blown neurosurgery that requires the insertion of 64 separate electrodes via a small specialized needle directly into your brain matter. In order to do this as precisely and reliably as possible, Neuralink will depend on a surgical robot to complete the procedure. Here it is. That's our R1 robot with our patient Alpha who's lying comfortably on the patient bed. Define comfortable. To get an N1 device, it's essentially these steps. Targeting and the incision, drill the craniectomy. An incision is made in the scalp and a small circular hole is cut into the skull, likely at the midway portion between the two parietal bones which connect at the top midline. A craniectomy is any surgery to remove a small portion of your skull. There are several devices that a surgeon can use to facilitate access to the brain, known as a burr hole, but in this case they've chosen a CNC drill. Usually a burr hole helps to relieve extra pressure on the brain. If there is inflammation as a result of blunt trauma or excess fluid due to a broken blood vessel. Any injury to the brain can cause extra space to be taken up inside the enclosed skull. Remove the tough outer meningeal layer called the dura, insert the thin flexible threads of electrodes, place the implant into the hole we created. In the current version of the procedure, the outermost meningeal layer or the dura mater must also be cut allowing direct access to the top of the brain. Dura mater is one of the layers of connective tissue that make up the meninges or the protective membranes of the brain pia, arachnoid, and dura from inside to outside. The most substantial of the three surrounds and protects the brain and spinal cord. The delicate needle used to implant the electrode threads cannot consistently pierce this protective layer. Take a look at how far you have to zoom in to even see it. By the time the features of the needle come into frame, you could see individual red blood cells in the same frame. And the imaging technology cannot predict the location of blood vessels through the thick combination of fibroblasts and large amounts of extracellular collagen. Avoiding blood vessels in the brain is vital to ensure that the surgery does not cause excess bleeding in the brain. And Neuralink employs a complex imaging machine to this end. It can target optimal insertion points, avoiding capillaries or small blood vessels that branch off from the arteries in the brain. It has quite the job to do, considering the total length of capillaries in the human brain is somewhere around 400 miles. And each vessel measures approximately 30 to 40 nanometers in thickness. Like really, really thin. Here it is in action. So as I mentioned, the brain is moving. Where we place targets in the beginning may not be where you want to insert at the moment the needle is going down there. Their machine also accounts for the subtle movement of the brain. Yes, you heard her correctly. Check out this fantastic image submitted to the National Health Institute by physician geneticist, Dr. Francis Collins. Though our thoughts can wander one moment and race rapidly forward the next, the brain itself is often considered to be motionless inside the skull. But that's not actually correct. When the heart beats, the pumping force reverberates throughout the body and gently pulsates the brain. So the robot can actually detect the vessels and then determine if we're going to insert onto a vessel or not, if it's safe to insert, and then avoid inserting onto major vessels. This is one application where a surgical robot is better suited for the job 
than a human being. Yes, a brain surgeon spends a lifetime honing their craft, but we don't have x-ray vision and our motor cortex is not optimized to make 64 life or death calibrations on the scale of nanometers in under 30 minutes. And then to have to repeat the process on many, many patients, this robot is truly an incredible piece of engineering. And at the recent Neuralink show and tell, we got to see it demonstrate some insertions in a brain analog. On the left is the view of the insertion area. And on the right, the robot's gonna peel the threads one by one from its silicon backing and insert it into the target. And just like that, we have our first insertion. The whole process of inserting uh, about 64 threads in our first product is going to be around 15 minutes uh, for this robot. Judging by the location of the implant and its intended function, the insertion site must be the... If you said motor cortex, you are correct. Located in the frontal lobe, anterior to the frontal sulcus, where it meets the parietal lobe of the brain, this region of the cerebral cortex is involved in planning, controlling, and the execution of voluntary movements. When someone suffers an injury to the spinal cord, their body becomes paralyzed because the signal path from the motor cortex to the muscles is impaired. And our motor neurons, neuronal cells that facilitate this communication, cannot do their job. When we intend to move our body, the upper motor neurons located in our motor cortex send nerve impulses downstream through the lower motor neurons in the spinal cord, which in turn transmit the signal to an effector muscle, fancy name for any muscle, organ, or tissue that can respond to a stimulus from a nerve. For persons with spinal cord injury, the connection between the brain and the body is severed. The brain continues functioning normally, but it's unable to communicate with the outside world. But by implanting a secondary Neuralink device below the level of the injury, a wireless connection is established between upper and lower motor neurons. We could place electrodes into the spinal cord adjacent to lower motor neurons, stimulate those neurons, causing the muscle to contract, and movement to occur. Remember, the M1 Neuralink device is capable of sending and receiving information. As well as being able to record from every channel, we can stimulate neural activity in the brain by injecting current through every channel. Elon and company intend to solve blindness by a similar mechanism, bypassing the eye and optic nerve to stimulate the occipital lobe in the primary visual cortex of the brain. This is a schematic of what a visual prosthesis using our end device might. The output from a camera would be processed by an iPhone, for example. Whether it's a supercomputer in your occipital lobe that processes detailed visual information or a supercomputer implanted in your spinal cord communicating wirelessly with your motor cortex, a complex series of zaps and literally reanimate the body. Oh, I know what it feels like to be gone. Take a look at this view from their surgical robot. We've placed electrodes across many millimeters of the spinal cord, deep into the ventral horn, into motor pools, very close proximity to lower motor neurons. The ventral horn is a column of gray matter that runs the length of the spinal cord and contains the cell bodies of the motor neurons, which send axons, or long cables that snake away from the main part of the cell, several times thinner than a human hair, to muscle fibers. A motor pool consists of all individual motor neurons that innervate a single muscle. And then we add a little computer magic and boom, this little piggy went to Marky, yo. So here's one electrode on one thread that when we stimulate causes a flexion movement of the leg. The activation of the electrode is the yellow waveform and the waveforms below it represent the movement of the individual joints. I'm very impressed at the speed and accuracy of the computer's analysis and obviously the stimulation of the pig's motor neurons. Austin begging comes to mind again though and I feel compelled to consider. This is a one isolated movement of the leg initiated by researchers and obviously refined through trial and error. Playing a sport, going for a walk, balancing in an upright position, heck, even just coordinating the movement of your arm is countless directional inputs. Calibrations made to look and feel like a smooth motion. Imagine suddenly assuming control of all of these functions at once through an interface that will feel entirely unlike anything you've experienced in the past, and then coordinating complex movements at once. These electrodes can cause motor neurons to turn on and off. Think of all the on-off instances in walking. Hip flexor activation, both up and down, the flexion of the knee and ankle, coordinating two legs simultaneously while accounting for variations in the terrain and environment, and the list goes on and on and on. For early adopters of this technology, like Began, it must feel like learning to drive a super complex manual vehicle. All right, so you go one, two, three, four, five. That's kind of what the body actually is. You flip the switch up and then go to six, seven, eight, nine. 
Makes sense. But eventually, as motor patterns are recorded and the associated neuron firing patterns refined, I can imagine an autopilot function becoming available. Hey Siri, take me for a spin around the block. Theoretically, even more complex tasks could be sequenced and downloaded into the device. Combat training. I know Kung Fu. The prospects are very exciting. Is there such a thing as a technology that cannot be hacked? What if someone takes control of my body via Neuralink and causes me to commit a crime? This remote has the ability to control your movements. With technology so advanced, this is a legitimate concern. And if it can do that, I wonder what else it can do. I sure hope Neuralink is devoting more time and energy to cybersecurity than they have apparently to the welfare of their test animals. I bet the monkeys enjoy their banana smoothie pumps but apparently there are more sinister things afoot when the cameras are off. Sorry, Elon, I saw the shot and I had to take it. A recent article published in Reuters reported the following. In all, the company has killed about 1,500 animals, including more than 280 sheep, pigs, and monkeys, following experiments since 2018. According to records reviewed in Reuters and sources with direct knowledge of the company's animal testing operations. Those sources characterize this as a rough estimate, the number is quite staggering. The article goes on to say, the investigation has come at a time of growing employee dissent about Neuralink's animal testing, including complaints that pressure from CEO Musk to accelerate development has resulted in botched experiments. Such failed tests have had to be repeated, increasing the number of animals being tested and killed, the employees say. Look, I don't know Elon personally, but from what I've read, it sounds as though he is prone to extreme behavior and can be a cutthroat manager. I can understand Elon approaching the prospect of a functional, affordable brain computer interface with urgency. It could seriously help a whole lot of people. But I have a question for you guys. Is there a cause that is so great it's worth leaving a path of destruction in the process. I hope the Neuralink team is able to address these problems moving forward and clean everything up before the device enters human trials. And for my part, maybe I'll wait to get my Neuralink until the kinks are all worked out. If you want to support the channel and the work of my team, then tip them by signing up as a member. If you liked the video, then be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. If you didn't, be sure to tell me why in the comment section down below. Otherwise, as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.